Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Causing to sin. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with each other. Today, for just a little while, I want to talk about for us or against us. You know, in order to understand where the disciples were coming from in this passage, you actually have to go back a little bit before to Mark 9, 14 through 29. And it says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. He asked them, What are you arguing about? A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they cannot. Jesus turned and said, You unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him to Jesus. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said. Everything is possible for those who believe. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind can only come out by prayer. So you see, in this story, the disciples are shown that they aren't quite all that they thought they, <coughs> they were. You know, the story begins with the father bringing his son first to the disciples and asking them to cast out the evil spirit. But the disciples weren't able to. So then they, in private, they asked Jesus, well, why couldn't we? And Jesus said, in prayer. So right off the heels of this incident, you go into the disciples walking along down the road, and they see someone who isn't a disciple, who doesn't follow Jesus around everywhere he goes, but they see this man casting out a demon and doing it quite successfully. So when they see this, they begin to get jealous and say, you can't do that. You must stop. Like, you're, you don't hang out with Jesus like I do. You don't have that right. Like, I, I hang out with Jesus. I get to do that. But you don't. So why do you think you should do that? And they, they, they're really proud of themselves. Because when they go to Jesus, they say, you know what, teacher, you know, we saw someone casting out a demon in your name, and we tried to stop him. Because he was not with us. They were <laughs> proud. They thought they had done something right. But then Jesus said, why would you do that? Why would you try to stop them? Don't you understand that if they're for us, if he's saying, if he's casting out demons in my name, he can't turn around and cast out a demon in my name and then in the next breath say something bad about me. You can't stop someone if they're moving in my name. This is basically what he was telling them. And it's, it's funny to look at the disciples because not last week, I know Michael talked about the disciples arguing about who's the greatest. You know, who's the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest when Jesus' kingdom comes? But see, the disciples were kind of intolerant. 
you know, they felt like they should be able to have all because they walked with Jesus and they talked to Jesus. They felt like they had the exclusive right to the power of Jesus and no one else could have that privilege. They were intolerant. And you see, I know us as a community definitely knows what intolerance is. You know, we've all experienced it in some form. I can remember back the many lies that I was told simply because I say that I'm a lesbian, but I'm also a Christian. You know, I can also remember the day that I was asked to leave my former church. And it was definitely an example of how intolerant religion can be. You know, first off, I had the notice that you're going to have a meeting Wednesday night. You need to meet with the leaders of the youth group. Okay, <coughs> no problem. Well, that particular night, through no fault of my own, I was a manager at a store, and so one of my workers didn't come in. I needed to stay and help out because I couldn't leave them shorthanded. So I missed a meeting. You know, I called and let them know I'm not going to be able to make it. Well, the meeting happened without me. You know, the directives were given down. And my leader at the time was sent to pass on the message to me. They came to my apartment around 11 o'clock at night to deliver the message. It was full of ultimatums. Like, all it was was, you're going to do this or you're going to be banned from the church. At the same time, while I'm being talked to by my leader, they've kind of cornered Bianca off to herself, and they're pretty much giving her the same runaround they were giving me. And at that point, I, I looked at it, and I, and I thought to myself, when did Jesus ever really give an ultimatum? He didn't. Jesus never gave an ultimatum. Jesus just said love. That was Jesus' whole thing. Jesus was so unbelievably loving that it... The Jews were upset. Like, how can you touch or a Samaritan woman? Or how can you do this and call yourself a Jew? But Jesus realized that, you know what? It's not intolerance that the world needs. It's love. You see, for me, in that moment, I discovered the truth that no amount of threatening can make me change the truth that I found in myself. They tried to get me to, you know, say I repent and go before the church and, you know, say that I, I was wrong and that I, you know, I know I'm wrong and I want to still be a member of this church. But as I looked at him, I just said, I can't. Because your truth that you believe to be true isn't what I believe anymore. Now, because of this, in all honesty, because of this, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to walk away. I left. And for three years, I kept myself away from that church. I kept myself to myself. And that's what it was. But you see, it was their intolerance that caused me to step away from God. Because I felt like there wasn't any love in their God. There wasn't any love in their Jesus. And that's what their intolerance cost me. And looking at what Jesus said is that, you know what? If they're not against us, that means they're for us. If they're calling out my name and they're praising my name, how dare you tell them that they're not my child? How dare you? You know, it's funny, I know Michael, when in Bible study, he says it all the time. It's like, you know, I wonder the people who teach the Bible so much, I wonder if they've actually read the words. Because if you actually read it, you would understand that God is so much about love and acceptance. He's not ostracizing people, he's bringing people to him. You know, I've, I honestly believe that Christian intolerance is a driving force behind why so many people choose not to follow God. You know, Gandhi said it best when he said, I like your Christ, I just don't like your Christians. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Christian, Christian intolerance had gotten so bad that author Albert Camus wrote in the following paragraph, Believe me, religions are on the wrong track the moment they moralize and fuminate commandments. God is not needed to create guilt or punishment. Our fellow man suffice, aided by ourselves. You were speaking of the last judgment. I shall wait for it resolutely. For I have known what is worse, the judgment of men. I'll tell you a big secret. Don't wait for the last judgment. It takes place every day. And that is honestly true. We don't have to wait for God to judge us because when we walk out that door, man judges us just the same. And even worse than God will. For God has mercy, but somehow Christians don't really like to show mercy. After I was judged and banned from my church, as I said, I left. For three years. For three years, I did my own thing, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. 
Because I felt like I, didn't never, I never wanted to put myself back in that position of pain and rejection again. And I did until I came into this place. Here, I found acceptance and love for just being who I am. You know, and I think that's a special trait that we have here at MCCC, that whenever someone walks in the door, whether it's your first time or you've been here many times, there's a love that runs through this place. And it's a love that draws more people in. And it's a love that causes people to want to stay. It's a special trait that I think God is proud to say that we are his kids. Because whenever his, someone that is not in our little group walks in, we immediately open our arms wide and do our best to hug them and make them feel as though they're part of the fold. It goes on to say, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. You see, for me, the intolerance was my stumbling block. It caused me to lose faith and turn away from God. And the same way they, and what they thought they were doing was right caused me to fall away we must be careful not to cause people to stumble ourselves. For the Bible says that the punishment is great for those who cause his children to falter in their walk. He also goes on to talk about our own stumbling and how we can become a stumbling block to ourselves. God gets in this, he gets a little into amputation really, really strongly because he says, <laughs> if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Because it would be better for you to enter life maimed with two hands. And if your foot causes you to stumble, Cut it off, because it would be better for you to enter life crippled. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. For is it better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than two eyes? And I think in this, he didn't want us to take it literally, though, although in the past, if you read through the historical things, you do find that people do take it quite literally, and they end up cutting off parts of themselves. But I think he just used it as a representation of what ways we are supposed to control ourselves. So the hands, the hands represent the things we do. Let not the things we do cause someone else to doubt God. Let not the things we do cause someone to falter in their walk. So we must be careful in our deeds and let everything we do be glorifying to God. Our feet, our feet represents the places we go. You know, we have to be careful, especially when we call ourselves Christian. It, it's funny because as teachers, we always say that we're held to a higher standard because, you know, as a teacher, if any parent sees you doing something that could be very well legal, they can take an issue with it and take it to the school and then you have to justify what you do on your personal time. But the same thing is said for Christians. When people believe you to be a Christian, even if you don't feel that way, you are held to a higher standard by them. So you have to be careful that what you do may not cause someone else to stumble. And then our eyes. Our eyes represent those things we see or the desire in our hearts. The desire in our hearts, it's very hard to desire the things of God if our hearts are evil. That's why the Bible says that we need to renew our hearts or we need to get clean hearts from God. And the only way to do that is to seek God and truly dive into his word. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that means that out of your heart is where your words will come from. So we need to be sure that our hearts our hearts after God, that we let those things that we desire be pleasing to God. You know, and today, looking at this and really understanding, you know what, as long as I'm for God, as long as I'm pursuing God, as long as I'm running after God, no one can take my God from me because I am His. You know, here in this place, we choose the path of tolerance and grace, not because it's broad and easy, because a lot of people will say it's so easy to be tolerant. It's so easy to allow everyone in. But churches prove every day that it's not. I remember stories when I would see in my grandmother's church, I would just see people who would, hadn't been to church in years. And you knew that they had hard lives. But if they didn't walk in dressed the way they were supposed to be dressed, you know, the women in their dresses and their stockings, if they didn't come in the right way, people automatically begin to talk about them. A few times they were actually asked to leave because of the way they were dressed. It's so hard to be tolerant. Because to be tolerant means, you know what, no matter what, you're God's child and I'm going to love you just that way. And it's easy, it's easy for people to say that the world has gotten too tolerant, the Christians have gotten too tolerant, but the truth of the matter is, Christians in general are too narrow-minded. They're too bigoted. If it's not their way, then it's the wrong way. 
But that's not what Jesus is calling us to. And I'm so glad to be in this place because we live a life that is totally accepting. We, we as a church body live a life that we love everyone who walks in the door. You know, the Bible says that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And if we continue to move in love, God will continue to open doors that will allow us to reach more of his children. For know today that we are children of God and that no matter what anyone else says, he calls us his own. His stamp of approval is on us and he is smiling for the work that we are doing. We are accounted righteousness and for whoever is with us can't be against us. Thank you.